had it. All right. Thank you. I am calling to order the African Heritage Reparation Assembly meeting of Monday, August 21st at 2.01 p.m. with the extension of Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. We'll do a quick sound check to make sure everybody can hear and be heard. And I'm gonna start uh, with you, Dr. Rhodes. I can be, I, I can hear everyone and I can see everyone. Great, and we can hear you. Ms. Bridges. I can see everyone. I'm sorry you can't see me, but it just, that's the way it is. <laughs> I don't know what's we wrong can hear with this, you well. But I, if you can hear me, I can certainly see you. All right, awesome. Um, and Dr. Shabazz, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, and you can be heard. And Hala. Oh yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. All right, excellent. I love your necklace. Is that a necklace, Hala? It's beautiful. Very powerful. Um, okay, so thank you. <laughs> um, I know that Yvonne um, is unable to join today, and uh, Alexis was going to try to join us at some point. So we will certainly keep our eye out for Alexis. Um, I am going to begin by reviewing just some general um, timeline information. So I sent a message um, stating that I hope that today will be our final day of deliberations. Um, and this will uh, give Mattia and I the opportunity over the next week before our meeting on the 28th to finalize a draft that we, I will hope, be able to uh, approve at least to the most extent that we can approve it on uh, next Monday. And so I just, uh, before um, saying any more about that, I just wanna pause and see if folks um, have any questions or concerns about that particular timeline. All right, great. So I should also add that uh, Dr. Rhodes and I are scheduled to meet with Paul Bockelman, the town manager, um, the town council president, as well as the chair of the finance committee on Monday, the 28th. We'll be meeting prior to our meeting. So um, that is the one piece that we'll still have to um deal with at Monday's meeting, uh, next Monday's meeting. And I've already alerted Mattia to that. So um, for just to give us sort of a, um, a, a look ahead at our next meeting, ideally we would approve a draft report. Um, and then the report will be, as I said in the message I sent, um, my mother-in-law who has worked on our graphics previously has agreed to work on the visuals for our report. So I would very much love to hear from members um, with respect to any particular visuals that you think would be important to include. This can include um, pictures, it can include other graphs or other images that um, you think might support whatever um, is written in the report. And then I'd also like to approve next week when we meet, if possible, a media plan. Um, I think it's really important that we as a committee are um, unified in whatever uh, media plan we we might we might have um, for when the report is published. So I have some thoughts and ideas, and I also welcome your thoughts and ideas um, to that discussion next meeting. Are there any questions about any of that? Yes, Ms. Bridges. You, what exactly are you meeting with Paul and Lynn about the draft that we're approving? No. Um, so uh, 
per the guidance here of the assembly, I have not shared the latest draft um, with any le leadership. Um, we'll be meeting with them specifically about the fund. Um, so the recommendation that we have on the fund, uh, well, last week we talked about the two right. possibilities. So we'll just be meeting with them regarding that piece of the report. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. All right, any other um, questions or comments regarding any of that? All right, excellent. So um, today I, I reviewed the report. I reviewed um, some other um, information that I wanted to share with the group. Um, and with all of that, I think there are um, some items that are going to be quick to go through, I think, that I'm going to start with. Um, but I would like to say that I think the biggest piece of our conversation today is related to the eligibility. Um, so we have in our report um, defined a philosophy on eligibility. It is visualized with concentric circles. Um, and it's important that this committee uh, has a discussion about how it sees that eligibility criteria um, being grounded into the municipal uh, reparations plan that we're proposing. So that will be sort of the bulk of our discussion. But before that, I just I wanted to um, go through a few other pieces, uh, starting here with um, the intro of our report. So has everyone at this point had a chance to look through the report to some extent, uh, the latest draft? Okay, great. Um, Ms. Bridges, your hand is still up. I'm just checking with you. Okay. Um, Sorry. So, no worries. Okay. So um, I, uh, as I was reviewing some information um, uh, in particular, I've uh, been, and I, I highly recommend this book, by the way, and I don't know if you can see it, but because um, I'm blur, I have a blurred screen. Um, this book is called The Black Reparations Project. It's the latest uh, publication by Dr. Darity and Kirsten Mullen. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, and very, very smart read. And one of the things that I think I would like to include, if there's no objection in our intro, is um, information regarding the sort of uh, trajectory of the, the the national support for um, reparations. And um, our own institution here, UMass, has conducted, I think, two polls now more recently regarding that. And so um, Dr. Darity has some of that information in the book, and I was hoping that we could, just to show uh, how the support for reparations has grown over the past 20 years or so. And there are some um, important surveys that have been conducted that um, we can reference. Is there any objection to that, including something, some language regarding that in the report? Okay, great. Um, and then let's see here, I made a list for myself, okay. We do, I'm flagging that we, um, and I should have said this when I first started, um, next week we will need to finalize the committee charge that we hope to include as in, in the appendix of our report. Um, and that is our primary, one of our primary recommendations. Um, so just to consider how you envision that um, committee to, to look. And you can always look at other charges that are available on the town's website. You can look at our own charge here. Um, but I think what's important is to uh, decide what we're recommending in terms of composition of the committee and what the, the charge of the committee will be um, and, and the purpose of the committee. So that's something that I'm not going to take the time now to go through, but if you could take a look at it in the draft report and um, provide feedback either via email or for next week, that would be great. Okay, so um, one other important, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm skipping. Okay, um, I had made a note in the draft 
about including um, some language, particularly in the intro um, from Dr. Darity himself. Um, and I wanted to share with you something from his book. Actually, we, Amherst is, is mentioned here in his book, in this latest book. Um, and in, in here, he is um, discussing how a municipal, a municipality could never properly fully uh, make recommend re make reparations. Um, it just a town would not have, according to Dr. Darity, the funds available to properly compensate um, residents. And so what he says about Amherst is Amherst, Massachusetts, making overtures to replicate Evanston's program has a smaller eligible black population of about 2000 persons. Even so, it would need 600 million to erase the racial wealth gap while having a current town budget of 85 million. Um, and that is based on his, um, his estimations on uh, what it would take for to, to bridge the racial wealth disparity for an individual, which um, in, in his book he says is 300,000. So I'm curious um, what, I thought that was a really interesting piece of information that he included in this book and just the, the discussion overall. And I'm wondering if folks would be open to really putting that out there, you know, directly in the report, in the introduction of the report um, and, and referencing Dr. Darity and then it would move into why we believe that uh, municipal reparations is um, why we support it. Dr. Rhodes. Yeah, um, let me see. I'm a, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I, you know, that quote is is is, is fine, but I, I I really want to make sure that everything that we start off with uh, in this introduction and that is Amherst specific, that people know we're talking about Amherst. I can see that reference being made later on, but I certainly cannot see it being made uh, in the first page or two. Because again, people from Amherst wanna hear about what we think about reparations in Amherst. And yes, the the uh, other parts that play into it is the national scene, but uh, you know, if I'm Joe Blow out there in the street, hey, I don't wanna hear it, I wanna know what we're doing here in Amherst and why we are doing it here in Amherst. Okay, let me just make sure I understand. So I think what you're saying, Dr. Rhodes, is that the piece about the national growth in support for reparations is something that you don't see necessarily being included up front and center in our introduction. Yes. How do you feel about um, the place where I've marked, perhaps we um, referenced Dr. Darity's work? Um, I thought this was a good way using the quote from his book. Um, I thought that was a good way to sort of tie it to Amherst. Um, but is that separate from your thought about the uh, overall national support? Or do you are you saying that you'd like for both of those to come at a later point in the report? Definitely. I, I, again, I just, that the, the opening paragraphs, the opening pages, et cetera, really have to be, for my, from my point of view, mm -hmm. focus upon us here in Amherst and what we are doing and why we're doing it. Okay. Well, may, I think Dr. Shabazz maybe was going to add to that as well. Dr. Shabazz? Dr. Sorry about that. I had a, a, only, a guest. <laughs> Dr. Shabazz, did you yeah. want to add to that or were you? The just... only thing that I would add is that in, in, as well, my concept for the introduction as well is um, to really hone in on um, our, our work, our uh, efforts to educate and to develop a commitment to reparations and the kind of tie-in I really think necessary to address in the 
intro, if we're in agreement, is that we hope that what we um, propose and what if uh, as the town adopts a, um, a municipal reparations plan along the lines of what our report provides, that it will make a contribution toward the realizing of um, the of a black reparations initiative or project nationwide. Mm -hmm. And um, the specifics about um, the funding piece of this um, could be, you know, developed, could be mentioned in the section of our report where we go into our funding uh, recommendations and um, in, in order to kind of clearly situate why the $2 million kind of endowment fund um, and whatever other uh, initiatives that the town can muster through CPA or through other financial sources to uh, help advance the reparative justice proposals where we, we make and that the community will make in the future that um, that that is not that is not comprehensive, full, or true reparations, and then that is a point where the the um, the Darity quote or whatever could be, uh, you know, or, or that we could reference that as part of the argument that we clearly understand that the uh, the piece we're recommending here uh, will not make whole the 2,000 or so black residents. It will not restore the dignity. It will not, it does not acknowledge the harm, the intergenerational harm that has been experienced um, at the magnitude that it must be. Okay. And I think that would be perfect there, but I think in our, in our introduction to the plan itself, it should be more about highlighting the nature of of our work, the nature of the project as we as we receive, as we were charged by the town and as we are here to deliver, just very succinctly. That really resonates with me. Um, and uh, I think that's a rather uh, very skillful way of including it um, to to support why uh, the funding that we have is not is not um, nearly adequate. Uh, <laughs> so I, I I I very much support that. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz um, and Ms. Bridges. I did see that your hand was up. Before I come back to Irv, I just wanted to check in with you. I just was. When after uh, Shabazz spoke, I was just before he spoke, and what Irv and he was talking about um, with um, Sandy, I just I because he was went to school, he was in Amherst for years. Um, I just wanted to agree that yet yeah, that his quotes um, should be included. Um, I'm not I I'm not quite sure if it should be. I was for it being in the introduction just because of it being him, just because of his book, just because he's from Amherst. And, um, but I guess it could be put in either way, but I think it really should be included. Awesome, yeah. And and maybe there's a way uh, to do both actually um, without uh, coming away from our central purpose that we have Great. in the introduction. Great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, I, I, Dr. Shabazz um, on Black in the Valley last week was talking about the report that I think I've shared with the committee that Dr. Darity was involved in when he was living in Amherst. Um, and I did wonder about whether we wanted to include that in, in the appendix. Um, I've sent that to you all, but that's a that's a side piece and, and you can approve or not that when um, you see the final report. Dr. Rhodes, is your hand still up or? Okay. Yes, it, it is. Oh, uh, it is up. I, 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 um, as you can well imagine, this school committee stuff has come front and center. 
And I am under siege at this point in time with things that I got to deal with. And not only that, I am remarkably saddened by the situation, more depressed than I thought I would ever be about a situation. So I got to sign off, but I, I got some things I got to deal with. Okay, Dr. Rhodes, no problem at all. All right, thank um, you. I wish you, we wish you the best with that. And thank you. Thank you for being um, a leader in that situation. Thank you, guys. Okay, uh, Ms. Bridges, is your hand? Yeah, I just wanted to ask one more thing. Is this, sure. I mean, to put Sandy's words in or, or whatever, is this something that we need to ask him if it's okay to do? or we can just go ahead and do it? I think that's a really good question. So I've been in touch with Dr. Darity and he knows I have the book and he <laughs> he knows I've read it. And um, I think if, I think given, uh, I think because he, like you said, Ms. Bridges uh, grew up here and has this connection um, here, it feels like it would be important to just at least to, to at least let him know. I think if it was somebody else um, and we were doing this report, it probably we can quote really whoever we want to if it's already in their book and right. made public, you know. But I think that there's a courtesy piece that you're probably feeling. Um, and and so I I have been in touch with him. I think he's probably expecting that we'll include some quotes from his book. Um, but I can certainly let him know again. Yeah, I, I saw his sister over the weekend. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she's trying to get him to come up here shortly. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Dr. Shabazz, is your hand currently raised? Yes, I am. Uh, I haven't seen the... Uh, text you're referring, you're referencing, um, Michelle, so I'm not sure what's going on, but um, uh, up until now, at least, I thought the figure was 800,000 uh, per eligible person, 300 is a substantial come down. So I'm a little worried in terms of, um, you know, kind of what's, uh, I need to read up a little bit or understand better what's going on. Not that it matters specifically to the question of, you know, the quote or how we engage the quote, but um, I am a little uh, concerned with what may be um, that that we're that, that some things may be changing that I'm not that I'm not aware of. That's all. Yes. Um, so I will send you. Um, in, in fact, Dr. Shabazz, I, I have a copy of this for you, um, but. It's it's page 201 of, of this newest book, Local Reparations, and he says, to illustrate this, we assume conservatively that the average payout per individual needed to bridge the racial wealth disparity is 300000 And there is a footnote here. So I'll make sure you get this so that, you know, because I, I think I also thought that number seemed um, lower than what I had previously heard. So, and maybe I'm missing something here. So I'll make sure you see it. All right, so that uh, that's good, okay. All right, there was one other um, piece that we haven't discussed as a committee that I think um, deserves some discussion here in terms of a possible recommendation. Um, and this is health um, and health disparities. And um, we haven't spoken in our report to health or to public health or to the state of public health in Amherst or to how um, we see uh, this influencing um, Black residents in Amherst. So I uh, just jumped on and, and looked at the Board of Health, and I wanted to share with you quickly. Um, let me see if I can just give me one second here. Here we go. Okay. Um, So the Board of Health has a, a statement that they released. Can everyone see my screen? 
Yes. Okay. Um, in 2021, the Board of Health released a statement um, of on racism in public health. Um, and they made some sort of uh, they made they made some recommendations in terms of actions um, that the community might take regarding uh, race and public health. And one of those actions was to put together a community assessment, which they have completed as of June. And I've just requested from the former chair of the Board of Health a copy of that. I haven't seen the final report. I'm not sure if others here have had a chance to see it through other work that you're involved with. Um, but I'm wondering what this committee feels about uh, at least supporting um, in our report this uh, statement on racism in public health, and then also potentially pulling something from the community assessment. Um, and I just, so I just want to open the floor up for discussion on this. And as I do that, I'm going to email this to you all right now. And, and so the floor is open. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, actually, I'll keep sharing so you can take a look. So any comments on including health or the support of this in our report? And uh, Jennifer, I just, I don't know if you're still there, but I know we've, we've, I think we've spoken about health as well. So if there's anything that you wanted to add, I would really would much appreciate your input. Dr. Shabazz. No. Oh, Jennifer, were you, did? No, I was saying I'm here. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I feel like we've spoken about this um, more than once. And so I just, uh, if you had anything that, and it doesn't have to be now, but if there was any um, input that you had on this, I would be grateful for you to share it with the committee. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Shabazz. Um, yeah, the only thing that I'm sort of specifically interested in um, relative to the um, the comments, uh, I, I like the idea of um, endorsing and supporting um, this initiative or, or these recommendations from the public health. So I'll answer that part of your question with a with a resounding uh, yes. I'm only thinking of how we might then further uh, go a little further than what's presented here to towards specifically uh, looking at black and looking uh, even more particularly at um, the issues of health. Um, relative to having experienced um, intergenerational uh, exposure to um, uh, from slavery on down to to contemporary racism um, the and and two things come to mind as maybe part of the additional study or discussion that um, might, take place in the future. And one is looking at the um, the report that came out from Johns Hopkins Medical uh, along with um, in Cobra, uh, that it's in our genes. Uh, I'm not saying the exact correct title of it, but I would like for um, future work done around public health and around racism as a public health emergency to uh, to look at that document, to study that document and to um, think about what the implications might be to our healthcare policy and public health policy and, and uh, um, uh, in our various town departments. Um, and secondly, the idea specifically of slavery, um, post-traumatic, slavery syndrome has um, been discussed and debated a lot. Uh, Dr. Joy DeGray uh, work has, um, you know, I think was even referenced in the California task force, statewide task force and some 
Um, you know, that could even be an additional place to look at what some of their uh, deliberations in California found uh, around the idea. Um, there's pros and cons to to the um, idea that certain kinds of intergenerational stressors uh, are developed um, and passed on through the, through society uh, that have roots in slavery. But um, I just would say if there's a way to perhaps uh, in, in the statement around our support for this initiative and these recommendations to also call for more specific look at the intergenerational dynamics, specifically of anti-Black racism. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. And I was just trying to find the report. I, I did read that when it was released in 2021, and it was very powerful. And as soon as I find it, I will send that to the committee as well as to Mattia. Um, thank you. Are there any other comments at this time about um, health? When I have, I just sent you the um, the uh, statement from the Board of Health so that you'll have that. And then when I have the community assessment from Nancy, I will also send that along. One additional okay. oh, point please. That, yeah. that I'm thinking about relative to the work that you all uh, put together uh, in reparations for Amherst and Anita Sauro um, findings, and as well as uh, Ash Hartwell, when they attempted to find data and they could find nothing or found very little that was disaggregated um, to the question of, uh, of, of, of Black uh, uh, exposure or, or, or Black Difference, differentials relative to the whole that we just don't have that kind of disaggregation by ethnicity, uh, by ethnic or, or racial ethnic background. And so it would seem to me uh, perhaps we will, um, that if we could see language that would try to capture that point in terms of recommending that our health authorities here locally uh, at least explore ways to try and um, track and capture this data, whether at the Bangs Community Center, whether in other activities. I think there's nothing about it that would make it illegal, particularly if it's voluntary, if it's self-reported. Uh, I can see no downsides to it. Um, if people don't want to, they're, nobody's holding a gun to their head to, to disclose how they, how they might identify but it's simply to provide the opportunity that if folks want to identify that they are, um, you know, black, if they are of, um, you know, of um, from the background of, um, yeah, as a free as a free black person in this society, uh, from from their genealogy, um, you know, it, it then kind of dovetails the work that we're talking about supporting through the Jones Library or through whatever research centers that enable us to kind of get a picture of the um, the genealogy, the background of those who live here who were who are in that in that first circle, in that first second circle of um, uh, of our concentric circles in terms of um, families that uh, tree that goes back to, the era of shadow slavery then and and were in fact uh have an ancestor who uh experienced shadow slave enslavement. It would go along with that to kind of track where where people are reporting if they care to report that that they are from from such a uh, a background or not. Absolutely. Ms. Bridges. Um I just wanted to ask um Shabazz, are you talking about, when you're talking about the Bang Center, I know Ash very well, but when you're talking about the Bang Center, are you talking about um, the people, the members, the seniors, um, to report what, if they're from that, if they're Black, if they're, if whatever, because we 
have, they have, because I'm not really, I'm downstairs, I'm not really with them. I help them. Before that, I work for directly with Mary, Mary Beth, but they have, when we put members in, when, we, when they first become a member, part of that, when we're putting their name, their date of birth, is their race. Um, so is that, is that what you're talking about? You know, thank you for the question. I think the senior center and even other agencies all across the board, it would be good to have an inventory of which ones do what you're describing the senior center does and which ones don't. And to kind of recommend that, that yeah, we, we might all provide that opportunity uh, for folks to, to self-disclose if they wish. Uh, I really had in mind, I guess, what is it called? The Masanti, the Masanti Health Center. I really had in mind more that when I referenced the bangs, not, not so much you know, the, the senior center operation, but you raise a good point and it's good to know that data is already being collected, at least on the level of race. I think that, and finally, I'll say this, I'm wondering if we may ponder the way, and and, and um, I can talk to um, Kiara um, and, and, and look a little more into it, but ways in which one can very succinctly also identify that they believe they have an ancestor who was enslaved. I know uh -huh. Florida, they use the term freed people um, and freedmen and freed women, that they come from the freed people. Um, there are others that are using uh, historical Black American. Uh, there are some that, that are using ancestral Black American to signal that they, they are here for multiple generations that go back to before 1865. So, um, but whatever that language might be, maybe that is, is the additional piece that we might want to recommend as part of an Amherst plan that all agencies consider, you know, even in addition to asking how people identify, may wish to identify racially or ethnically, how do they specifically identify, if do they specifically identify as having um, African ethnic heritage that um, uh, goes back to the era of, of enslavement uh, or an ancestor who was enslaved. Dr. Shabazz, thank you for that. And Ms. Bridges, um, I just, I wanna pause us for a moment. Um, we normally have two periods of public comment. I haven't called the first. Um, and I see Matia's hand is up in the audience. I want to check with Mattia because she is um, so thoughtfully uh, observing all of our meetings and just want to make sure. Um, I'm not sure if she's coming in for public comment or uh, for a, a sort of more of a technical issue. I also see that Jennifer's hand is raised and I have the same thought about checking in with Jennifer. So let me check in with you, Jennifer, and then I'm going to um, call public comment and I'm going to take Mattia first and we'll see what uh, Mattia has. Jennifer. Yep. So I was just going to say that I'm on the board of the Hilltown Community Health centers and so that information is voluntary but i don't know how they go about uh expo giving it out to the community so i can find that out that would be excellent thank you that would be great okay so while we um bring matia in i'm gonna just read the public comment statement um and um, I will say there's just um, a couple people in the audience. And so if we need a second period of public comment, I'd be happy to call it uh, later in the meeting if somebody else arrives um, or if um, somebody else would like to speak again. But uh, maybe consider this our, our, our uh, double up here on our um, public comment for today. And um, let me read that. Uh, during the public comment period, the chair will recognize members of the public when called on. Please identify yourself, state your name, pronouns, and address. Uh, residents are welcome to express views for up to three minutes. And um, we normally do not engage, although um, in this case, we may uh, clarify or answer questions um, accordingly. So um, I see Mattia. Mattia, welcome. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. 
Uh, I just wanted to, uh, in reference to what Dr. Shabazz mentioned about the previous report, um, the reparations for Amherst report in which Anita Saro contributed a um, section on health. The thing that came um, forward in that section as being a key driver of health disparities in healthcare is a lack of uh, providers of color. And that that is, um, and that folks practicing medicine locally are well aware of that problem locally. And so if that is consistent with the needs assessment document, um, when that arrives, I wanted to ask, um, would you guys like me to center that in our, um, in what we say about public health here, that like that is a known problem locally, providers are acknowledging that that's a problem and that is nationally a driver of health disparities in, in care access. Um, so, so do we want to center that in any, any conversation here on public health in the report? Excellent, thank you, Mattia. And I see Dr. Shabazz has his hand up. I can wait till later if you needed to finish up with other public comments. I do not see any other hands raised, um, but I'll just uh, say again that if if you'd like to make a public comment, um, please use the raise hand function. Um, and I will check in again before we uh, close the meeting so that if there is something that arises in the meantime, um, attendees will have an opportunity to make public comment. Michelle, can I say one more thing? I you're, just, you're still on. Yeah, we, yep. There's no one else with their hand raised. So please, yes. Awesome. I just want to make sure that before the conversation closes today that um, we are going to touch on or you guys will provide guidance on the eligibility section um, for me to do this coming week. Um, and um, that's it for my comments. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, that is sort of what I was hoping would be the bulk of our, our discussion. And that's up almost next. <laughs> so Great, absolutely. You. Okay. Thank you so much, Matia. And Dr. Shabazz, did you want to respond to, to, yes. well, to that? I, okay. I, I would certainly support a centering around that, that question of um, disparity in reference to providers. I think the evidence for that is, is clearly there. I know from um, my work on the UMass campus, which you know, provides the bulk of our black population every year, the black student body that is there. Um, it has come up uh, in um, year after year from students, the the lack of available, for example, mental health care providers on on the faculty on the uh, um, I mean, just as part of UMass um, and the the, uh, the the providing of counselors, uh, they have um, one of the fixes to that was to contract our, our um, um, counseling group out at UMass will um, contract with providers from Springfield who periodically come in and uh, provide counseling services, especially for African-American students that have indicated they would prefer, they would like to have a, a counselor to meet with um, of 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 their own ethnic background to with whom they could they could speak with, and um, and so the you know it it's it's a stark issue just in that one area concerning African American students. So I think that is definitely uh, 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 a matter we would want to amplify from that original report under this broad area of health that. Uh, you, Michelle, have have so wisely, you know, asked us to to visit upon today. Thank you. Excellent. All right, that's great. Um, so there's just one other piece that I wanted to throw out there, um, and this is something before we talk eligibility. Um, this is something that I um, saw in the California reparations report, and I thought it was um, an important, it, it was really important, I thought. Um, and, and what it is, is um, they are recommending that um, an individual claims process be, uh, be created so that um, there's 
uh, for example, a family like the Coleman family, who they have um, a harm that they can document um, that occurred here in Amherst. And perhaps um, the sort of initiatives uh, that we're putting out there um, and recommending that the fund support don't uh, narrowly sort of get at what that particular harm was. Do we want to recommend to the successor body that they consider the, the development of a claims process um, so that one could uh, come to um, the successor body and, um, and, and whatever the process might be that they develop is able to um, make a, a particular claim? I think it's, um, I'm sure that there would be I'm sure I I can already I already know that there would be some concern about this uh this sort of uh recommendation but I'm curious what the rest of the committee feels. Dr. Spaz. And uh, Alexis, welcome. Can you hear us, Alexis? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> and I got your message, Hala, so I'm keeping an eye on you. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dr. Shabazz. Well, <clears throat> very briefly, I just will say I've wrestled with such an idea uh, as well, Michelle, and um, the idealistic side of me would say, yes, let's do something. And then the practical or shall I say realist in me <laughs> says, you know, that I don't see much especially in recent experience that would suggest that this would go anywhere tangibly. And to that extent, I would reference, for example, the July 5th incident um, in which when it finally got down to it, the town manager, you know, said I, that he feels at least in his reading of his power that his hands is tied unless a lawsuit or unless mm -hmm. something was done through the Massachusetts Commission Against uh, Discrimination um, that he could not, um, does not feel it within his power or authority to address um, a perceived um, uh, incident of ra anti-Black racism or perceived incident of uh, racial discrimination um, with, uh, in terms of here is um, some, uh, here is a stipend, here is some money to go and have yourself checked out if there was any kind of mental health harm. Here is some money to try to at least symbolically say, we understand what happened that night. Uh, there was a there was an error. There was something that we don't agree with. We don't think it was is is correct. Something was said that was not correct. Things were done that should not have been done. You know that even where he might believe it, he doesn't have the authority unless there was a lawsuit initiated or at least some letter from a lawyer saying I threaten you with a lawsuit before he could do anything. Well, if that same kind of logic would prevail with our successor group or our community, uh, you know, uh, uh, black town meeting group say, hey, we see an incident here. We think it, it, it has manifestations of anti-black racism, structural racism, and we think the way to make it right and to promote reconciliation is to give X dollars uh, to the the harmed the harmed uh, individual or individuals, and then it comes back to oh, but no, we don't know that there's a harm, or we'd have to adjudicate that there was a harm, or we'd have to have a threat of a letter of adjudicating that there was a harm before we we can do anything. I just am left in I'm I'm in a real uh, difficult place. Uh, in terms of, yeah, on the one hand, well, let's go ahead and, and recommend it anyway. But on the other hand, if that's not anything that um, the system, and we're talking about the structure of, of power and the structure of authority in our town, if that's not something that the structure of authority 
would be prepared to deal with on some good faith basis, then I don't know. I, I, I'll say one final thing. When the, as the Civil War was ending, um, and as the Union troops occupied areas, when Black people were still being directly harmed, I'm talking about being whipped by people who asserted they were still their owner, being things being stolen from them, things being being uh, told they had to do such and such work, uh, um, you know, rape. Um, the the imposition of uh, uh, in so many different forms, and um, people would then make complaints to the troops. The troops could, you know, adjudicate, and then so there were military courts. And then later, as they began to rebuild the court system after the war, uh, they would try to bring things through the courts, but. This was a very deep problem area in terms of um, the, the capacity for communities to, to try and reconcile because again, so much of the population still had the view that black people were subhuman. Black people did not have the same rights as everybody else or the same capacities as everybody or weren't like everybody else. So um, it, it seems to me we are almost, this is a legacy relative to our structure of power and our structure of authority. This is kind of a legacy going all the way back to there that um, I wish somehow our report, what we're saying could break through to the community that you need to break out of this prison of the, of the legal structures and be able to say, I can hear it from the community. I can hear it from black community members if where they see harm and could then find ways to do more to address it than what the chief of police at the time said he would do, which is to buy everybody a pizza, you know, buy some pizza and let's have a let's have a pizza party. Um that's where I'm. That's where I'm at on this. It'd be nice to put something in like that, but if we don't, it, I, I'd like to hear others' view of whether that could have any practical resonance. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Yes, let's keep the floor open on this. I also, as you were speaking, I thought about the Human Rights Commission and part of their charge is to receive individual complaints. Um, and so perhaps our recommendation can be that um, when such complaints involve a resident who identifies as Black, uh, that the, the, the successor body would be made aware of that and there would be some collaborative effort to, um, to make whatever recommendation is made through the Human Rights Commission um, that's that's an alternative or, or way I think of. Um, so I'm going to go to um, uh, Jennifer. Are you speaking technical or are you speaking? Um, I was going to speak on what you just said about the HRC. So yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. And I mean, I don't. I guess we could ask the individual if we could share the information with the successor group because it's confidential information, right? And then. There are recommendations that it's kind of hard because the HRC doesn't have like authority to necessarily do anything. But typically, if you get a phone call from the HRC director or assistant director, something changes. So it's, you know, a little bit sticky, but I would suggest talking to the HRC members about it. That's a great idea. Um, do you know if they have an upcoming meeting? Um they just met last Wednesday, so they don't, oh, they're going to be at the council meeting tonight, but I don't know if that's the right place to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, my other thought is, you know, Ronnie and Liz Haygood are the co-chairs now, and so okay. they're always willing to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I know Ronnie and Liz. Good. Okay, I'm going to go first to Ms. Bridges because her hand was up and then down, and then Dr. Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I just, when you mentioned the Coleman family for a, a claim, um, 
I'm just thinking, you, you've, I've heard you say the Coleman family a lot. Um, I'm thinking that there may be, I'm sure there are more families besides the Coleman family that haven't been mentioned. I, or I don't know if you know of more black families that were in their same position. I don't miss Bridges, but this is exactly where if there were, um, how would a family, you know, it's, it's hard enough to come out and, 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 and address these matters, uh, even with people maybe that you trust, but how about to address them with a government, a town government, you know, so that's sort of where I was, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. That's something, uh, it has to be um, further discussed, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so let's sort of th think on that and see how we might want to address it and um, and also think about, you know, some of this that we can't necessarily tackle with the time we have left. Um, we can certainly leave um, as, you know, recommendations to the successor body. Dr. Spaz? Yeah, I want to amplify how that we try to think of strong language for the successor body to try and be a space for adjudicating claims um, where it specifically involves instances of anti-Black racism or perceived anti-Black racism. Uh, understanding this, the HRC would only be empowered, if I understand correctly, relative to the charter, they'd only be empowered to speak to um, or questioning issues of abuse of power or, or discrimination for internal town committees. And if we take, for example, the, the case of the, um, I see Jennifer's hands up, maybe I can be rescued from, from making a mistake here, but um, the case of the Coleman family, for example, doesn't involve malfeasance necessarily by town, any town department per se. It concerns a private entity, that being Amherst College. So, uh, or, or in the main, the main culprit being Amherst College. So I wonder, it, it, so it says to me, I don't think we necessarily ought to chase the HRC uh, connection uh, quite so much as to really empower the, in our recommendation, the successor body to be uh, empowered to initiate uh, investigations around claims. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to hop in there yeah, real quick please. and just say that the HRC hears cases of, of any form of discrimination from anyone who works, lives, visits, or owns a business, goes to school in the town of Amherst. So there's no limit to who, what cases they hear. Um, they hear all cases. Uh, and really the way that it's set up now, the HR director and myself are the ones that are handling the case, the cases at this time. And we report them to the HRC only because we're trying to protect the complaintant. Like we don't want them to have to be in a public meeting yeah. to express that that and so the HRC members or commissioners and the HR director and myself are working on how we can revise that so that the HRC commissioners can be more involved. Okay so are you saying just to clarify that if somebody felt they have been harmed by let's just say a bank in Amherst um, I'm just coming up with that, that they could make a claim through the Human Rights Commission for that to be in, explored and investigated? Yes. So as the HRC report, the state of the HRC report that's going to be read tonight at the council meeting states, I think we had about two, um, if not three Amherst College complaints. We've had um we we had the the ones that were internal but we we had them for amherst college as well so not everyone knows about this mechanism to use right to utilize this is where they can put a complaint so that's at least at minimum good information to get out to the community that this is a, a way that you can file a complaint 
Absolutely. If that, if, if that's all that we do just to, to, I think, um, illuminate that mechanism is available. Um, but, uh, and I think, um, whatever we can recommend for the successor body to be empowered as well as is, is equally important. So, um, the other thing that I just, this thread I wanted to, uh, put together is um, the work that the DEI department is doing where we're already recommending um, truth and reconciliation. So if we come back to Dr. Shabazz's example about the July 5th incident, um, if there had been some something in place that was sort of methodical that would have um, provided the feedback around, you know, what an apology could have uh, done in that circumstance and had an apology been made um, immediately, how that might affect have affected the trajectory of, of what occurred and, and how, how painful that experience was for our entire community, all of our community. Um, and so I just, we want to maybe think about the tie in there and under that particular recommendation, how we might um, even include more specific language about um, that sort of um, piece of the communication, the power of an apology, the power of an apology, you know, in our community. Um, Okay, so I see Kiara's hand is raised, and I'm going to go ahead and just say this is our second period of public comment. I'm going to bring in Kiara, and then we're going to um, jump into the eligibility, and that will be sort of the uh, the remainder of our time together today. Um, so, Kiara, I think you're being you're coming over, um, and I am just needing to check into something very quickly. Um, if you, I'm going to go on mute for just one second, just a recess for one second, please. Jennifer, are you able to bring Kiara over? My apologies. Um, I, I, there was a call that came in from the high school and my daughter's over there doing a tryout for volleyball. So I just wanted to make sure that um, there weren't any emergencies. Um, Kiara, I'm, I'm not sure. Let me see if I can bring you in. I think Jen there you are. All right. Welcome Kiara. So sorry about the delay. Okay. There we go. Um, I don't know if you can see me or not, but um, I just wanted to comment on um, how you might um, designate ethnicity or disaggregating your your data. So um, just from the federal as well as on Massachusetts on the Massachusetts level. So um, earlier in the year, the Office of Management and Budget federally they put out a call that they were going to be revising um, Statistical Policy Directive 15, which is how they list out race and ethnicity on all federal documents and how they 
um, designate things there. And um, so they had a, a, a process where people were, you know, submitted their public comments and they had actually three town halls where predominantly the, the attendees were black Americans. And they also, um, of all the written comments that were received, uh, the most common designator that black Americans preferred was black American in terms of an ethnic identifier. Um, other ones, of course, were American freedmen, American Negro, um, foundational black American, et cetera, terms like that. Um, and really the one of the most important and common um, desires was that actually the current race, I'm sorry, the current black or African-American race category actually be um, dismantled altogether and that it would be replaced with uh, more specific categories like a designation for black American, for Caribbean, for um, sub-Saharan African, so that each um, at each group would have at, at minimum a, a minimum reporting category, which would prevent any any individual group's data from being swallowed up into this just generic black category where you don't you don't you're not able to see those specifics. Um, so that was the the most important thing. And on the state level, um, there is a bill in the House that's being proposed to actually do the same thing on the state level, and that is um, House Bill three zero zero three. And of course, they will have to follow whatever the OMB um, ultimately decides, which probably will come out probably next year or maybe 2025. Um, but what right now what the state is, is trying to do is also do, do desegregation at the state level. But what they're looking at, they're, they're following the current OMB standards, which basically is that the race is Black or African-American, and then they would identify statistics for all subgroups um, and the, what they're using to, to designate ethnic Black Americans, those whose ancestors may have been enslaved in the United States. Um, some people had free ancestors, but they're using the term African-American, which, which speaks to the problem of why people are wanting to dis to completely get rid of that, that um, aggregate category, because if it's still called Black or African-American, then those who are ethnically African-American who designate that, their data will still be swallowed up into the generic um, category. So you won't actually get, get that data. You'll get it for, let's say, Haitians or Cape Verdeans, but you won't have it uh, for those ethnic Black Americans. So that if if that passes, uh, right now it's in the House Ways and Means Committee, but if that passes, it will go into effect in January of 2025, and which would then, of course, apply to all municipalities as well, including Amherst. Um, so I would recommend, you know, Black, but you would at least um, the, honor the most popular one, which was Black American in terms of ethnicity, the Freedman term is more so a political or, or legal status identifier. It's not, not so much ethnic, rather rather more so political. Um, so Black American was the most popular and most desired among Black Americans across the country. We have a Black American heritage flag, and that is, that is what's most accepted among you know everyday people is Black American. So um, I just wanted to offer that. Thank you so much. That is very, very helpful. and. Um really curious about the bill that you mentioned as well. Um, so we could, we'll look, we should look into that. They actually had a, they had a, um, a hearing on it last month, uh, but it is, it's, it is moving along, but they have not, we did submit edits for it for them to consider, you know, the black American, I think we submitted black American or American freedom in, in combination. Um, but those were not, were not um, recognized at this point. So it, it still is, is in its current form as it is. So, I mean, it's, it doesn't really help um, ethnic Black Americans if it passes, but it would help other groups to have their data um, uniquely collected. If you have a good link, we'd appreciate it. I will send that. Thank you, Kiara. Thank you so much. All right, so I don't see any other hands um, for public comment. So at this time, I'd like to jump into the question of eligibility. And as I said, um, we, uh, through the um, very uh, thoughtful work of Dr. Shabazz um, and the position paper that he had um, shared with us early on in our process, then we developed the philosophy of the um, concentric circles and now we really need to um, discuss how that philosophy that we're sort of plopped into the report right now, um, how does it um, 
as Mattia put in a note in the report, when the rubber meets the road, how does it actually uh, provide a lens for um, for the way that the fund is being used, the initiatives that are being um, decided, and and how will the successor body use that lens to determine eligibility? Um, and I wanted to just before the floor opens, we have a uh, recommendation right now in the draft report regarding providing resources um, for folks to determine um, their lineage. And um, and we haven't really talked much about that here. And so I'm opening the floor now to, to any suggestions about this and I, in the meantime, will bring up that part of our report so that we can look at it. Okay, I just, um, I'm just seeing a note that Ms. Burgess has to leave. And so um, we'll still have a quorum as long as Alexis and Hala can stay present. Um, and so I am gonna just check in quickly. Um, Hala and Alexis, do you have another, 10 or so minutes for us to complete this discussion. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Shabazz, is that true for you as well? Yeah, I think we should try to push to 3.30 if we can. Okay, great. So if anyone wants to take the floor while I'm pulling this up, um, that would be fantastic. Um, and um, if not, you just take a second while I, I'm going to pull this up to share. I'll jump in to offer a, a few a few tweaks or reminders of a, of a few tweaks. Um, so one on the so anyway the the basic concept or uh, theory of eligibility we lay out here involves three aspects. It involves identity, it involves residency, and it involves um, the. Um, what's the other one? It involves. <laughs> um, uh, I don't have it before me, but um, let me address the residency one. So one tweak we said about residency is that those who have been or are, are presently are residents um, is the priority of our reparative justice program. So someone that is not a, that is, that has never been a resident and is not a resident. Um, would not have, you know, real standing in the program that we are we are initiating. Those who um, are currently a resident have, of, of course, then considerable standing for what we are doing. Uh, but we are not completely excluding those who have been a resident, uh, but are, um, are 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 not presently a resident that they are not excluded from consideration, but again, they are within the concentric circles uh, at, a, at a wider level of, of consideration than, than those who are currently uh, resident. And um, I think, for example, some of the points we made was for someone like Reynolds Winslow or someone like um, um, the uh, Edwin Driver or, or folks who, who once were here or attempted to be here, but ran into obstacles, ran into anti-Black racism, that, that those cases, those stories are nonetheless important to what, what reparative justice is all about. Um, in the question of uh, uh, lineage, in the question of lineage then, that um, our plan prioritizes those with a direct lineage to people who were enslaved in the United States, people of African descent who were enslaved in the United States, occupy uh, the center of, of, of our concern or at the center of our concern. That does not then exclude people who are black, but, and, and have experienced racism in Amherst since the eight, since, since the, the period of shadow slavery was ended, whenever you would call that period or when slavery was ended, that um, they are there, but they may not, but they are, are, are at a wider level of, of, op, of, of in terms of the, the concentric 
circle idea. So within the lineage standard, the um, there is a certain uh, centrality given to those with an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. Um, but we are not excluding from the conversation those who experience anti-Black racism, uh, but experienced it outside the United States or those who experienced anti-Black racism uh, in, in more recent years, who've, whose family come over in more recent uh, uh, years um, in, in the 20th or 21st century, but um, were not, uh, and experienced it here in Amherst, but again, don't have that direct lineage. They're not excluded from consideration or concern, but they are not at the center of our program. And then finally, there is the identity standard. And even here, what we say is, is that one who identifies as Black but may not exclusively identify as Black. In other words, at the center of our analysis are those who identify as Black and who can meet, for example, the Darity standard of have proof of it going back you know, 12 years before our reparative justice program uh, that they identified as Black. Uh, uh, but uh, again, those who, uh, may have just awoken yesterday to their having Black ancestry uh, and don't have proof within 12 years, they would not be excluded from consideration or, you know, someone who is of, of mixed race um, and the actual amount or, um, you know, connection within their own background, their own lived experience and their own genetic background to a black ancestor may be very, very distant, right? And Alexis gave us stories about, you know, about how that could be possible and where does that person stand? Who is now prepared to claim because they now have the evidence, they now have the information, but they may not have been raised in that circumstance from, from birth, okay? So all of that then is just a little bit more of the tweaking and the um, uh, deeper contextualizing of these uh, uh, of the centering kind of model around eligibility that looks at both the lineage standard, the identity standard, and a residency standard. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And I wanted to note that um, Ms. Bridges is still in the meeting. She was able to move some things. So just to, because um, I'm sharing screen, it might not be obvious. Um, one of the questions that I have for this committee is, um, you know, I, I, a curiosity really that comes to, to mind for me. Um, Dr. Shabazz, are you still here? Uh-oh, I think we might've just lost. Um, hang on. I'm just going to stop our share real quick so I can see my screen better. Okay. Um, it looks like we might've lost Dr. Shabazz and, um, I would just ask Jen just to keep an eye on the attendees in case, um, he returns. It, yeah, that would be great. Um, so the one of the questions that comes to mind for me is, um, oh, just one quick second, please. Just going to recess one second. That was Dr. Shabazz. He is coming back. Um, he just had to move locations. Um, so the question that was occurring for me was if we look at that, uh, the circles here and we, I'm not sharing anymore. Let me share again. Um, if we look at the circles and we consider uh, sort of how many people in Amherst would, uh, you know, 
we be talking about in each of these layers of the circle? Um, and I think that I've spoken with Dr. Shabazz about that. So maybe when he comes back on, we can revisit that. But um, I'm so I've I've heard what Dr. Shabazz has said, and I'm still I still uh, want us to continue to explore this question of how. Um, welcome back, Dr. Shabazz. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. So the question that I was just ex asking is if we were to look at each of these layers of the, uh, or each circle, how many people are we talking about um, in Amherst? Um, and I don't know if we can, you know, of course we can't be exact by any means, um, but is this any part of the discussion that we want to have in the report? Um, and then again, um, how are we saying that this eligibility model impacts, let's just think about some of our recommendations, youth empowerment, youth education, affordable housing, um, entrepreneurial uh, grants, business grants. Um, how would this model, um, I, you know, it's important that we justify why we've included this here. And that's my concern is how would this model act uh, to determine, because I don't think we would turn anyone away that um, within the framework of those recommendations that we're making. So where does this actually become relevant? And uh, even if it doesn't somehow become relevant, it's still important, I think, for this committee to make a position um, and state a position on this. Um, so that's. If I might offer please. my thoughts on that. So first of all, let's say, as we've been talking, that um, the amount might be 100,000 or 50,000, uh, between 50 and 100,000 one year that were eligible to be distributed. And um, let's say in the first six months you gave away 50,000 and now you're in the second half of the year and you've got 50,000 more to give, but you've got a number of proposals or a number of, um, of requests, okay? Somebody's got to go through those and see what you could do relative to those requests for that remaining 50,000. Well, at some point then the uh, you might have to make some priorities. Um, do you give one fifty thousand uh, dollars grant uh, to to one uh, uh, request, or do you try to split that that fifty up? And then you might, in making the calculus in terms of who might get out of the multiple requests, this framework uh, might come into play to say, hey. These are all very good requests, but based upon the residency standard and the lineage standard and the uh, identity standard, we might say we're going to prioritize more somebody who's living in Amherst, who has ancestry, uh, who is a Black American, that is with ancestry going back uh, to slavery times, and who um, is... Uh, um, you know, has the black, has self-identifies and has the black lived experience. It involves those people uh, who are going to benefit from the grant that's being made first and foremost, as opposed to another group that was, you know, looking for something that might be a benefit, say, to, you know, BIPOC and non-BIPOC. Uh, it might involve um, a, a request from someone who's not even living in Amherst that is making making the proposal. I, I'm just you know I'm just saying you might that's where the 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 model might come into play in helping folks think about. So everybody's being heard. Every request is being looked at. Everyone is you know is. Uh, uh, you know, within this framework, who meet this framework has eligibility, but you then are using it to kind of see where you might have 
uh, spend your limited resources in a given year. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Um, are there other thoughts on this? Um, You know, I was just thinking about our, our charge and, um, you know, one of the primary questions that was that was, you know, asked of us in the charge was to determine eligibility. And I think that eligibility is something that, you know, when I'm reading Dr. Darity's book, The Black Reparations Project, again, um, it's, it's a really, really great read. Um, it it just sort of highlights that this question of eligibility has been around for a long time and it's something that's being talked about um, amongst scholars and, and all sorts of people. Um, and again, just trying to clarify how, uh, you know, the, the significance of the question as it relates to our report. And um, I'm, again, really very much in support of including this uh, model and um, welcome additional feedback over the next week from folks if there's some uh, ways that we think we can ground it um, even more than what Dr. Shabazz has just offered, which I think is is fine on its own. And I think there might be an even deeper thread here that we can um that we can include in the report. So I'm still doing that processing too. Um, so just uh, again, wanting to check in before it's about, it's it's just a, a close to the time that we've really pushed to the max here. Um, and our next meeting is the uh, week from today on the 28th at our usual time. Um, and Matia and I will endeavor to get as much of what we've discussed today into the report. Um, we'll also be sharing with you shortly the sort of supplemental report, which includes the recommendations that we've made to other institutions. Um, we had to include some footnotes and things there. And so uh, we'll be sharing a draft of that with you all. Um, and if um, there are, I was hoping to poll folks to see about getting together to do a group shot. I would I really would love to have a group shot in our final report. And uh, Yvonne is the one that I need to check in with to see if she's local. I think everybody else is um, pretty much around. Raise your hand if that's not true or just let me know offline. Um, but I will send a poll out for that in terms of trying to get together for a group shot. And um, and then, of course, I have a plan for us to get together um, once we're all completed with this as well that I'd love feedback on. So any other comments or questions right now or any member reports or anything else that uh, is important? All right. Well, thank you. Uh, it was really a great meeting and uh, a lot was, I think we, we've deliberated upon a lot today and I'm kind of getting sad that our work is, is coming <laughs> so close to an end, but um, the community, I think, is really eager to see to see the work that we've been doing. So um, peace to everyone, and I'll see you all next week. And I'm adjourning at 3.29 p.m. Thank you. Bye-bye.